All right. Before we get started, I want to go over a few housekeeping items. Um, this webinar is scheduled for 45 minutes plus 10 to 15 minutes of Q&A. We want this webinar to be interactive, so we encourage your participation. To participate, enter your questions in the Q&A tab located at the top of your Zoom console. And if we're unable to get your questions today, um, we'll follow up by email. Lastly, I want to remind everyone that a recording of this live webcast and, and a copy of the PowerPoint slides will be emailed to all the registrants. And I'd like to welcome everyone to today's webinar, File Upload Protection, a Critical Gap in Web App Security. As organizations move to the cloud, thousands, if not millions of documents are now being shared among collaborators on a daily, weekly, and a monthly basis, perhaps in a single organization. And these files are being uploaded to either a web portal, a customer portal, such as um, an insurance or mortgage application, or a support portal, um, such as attaching files to a support ticket. And at the same time, uh, IT is investing an enormous amount of effort into building high availability and fault tolerance systems and securing them. However, file upload remains a major attack vector, and far too often it's covered, not covered by traditional web application defenses. So in today's webinar, we'll cover uh, three types of risks to web applications and how to apply a zero trust model to both the users and the files they upload, as well as the devices from which the files originate. This presentation will focus on a high performance deterministic methods which neutralize threats, whether they're known or unknown, in up uploaded files. And then lastly, we'll introduce how OpSWAT can help prevent these threats and help you maintain compliance. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. So at this time, I'd like to uh, introduce our, our primary speaker, George Pritchett. He's the Director of Product Management here at OpSWAT. And again, my name is Douglas Rebeck. So I'd like to start by telling you a little bit about OpSWAT. So OpSWAT is a global leader in critical infrastructure cybersecurity protection. Our solutions enable organizations to minimize the risk of compromise by implementing processes that ensure the secure transfer of files and devices to and from critical networks. We've been protecting uh, the world's mission critical organizations from malware and zero attacks since 2002. Uh, we have over 1,500 customers and 98% of uh, their power facilities. And we've recently launched a uh, training program and have certified more than 2,000 IT professionals on critical infrastructure protection best practices using OpSwap products. So along with our global presence, we're uh, fanatical about providing premium support for our customers to ensure their success. Right now, I'd like to hand the uh, presentation over to George Pritchett. Thank you very much, Doug. Hi, everyone. Um, as Doug mentioned in the introduction, we're going to cover a couple of topics uh, today in this presentation. Um, most important is like, based on where your file lives, are you exposed to certain different um, uh, risks, right? And we're going to talk a bit about vulnerabilities in the apps, but also the vulnerabilities highly coupled to the file upload uh, use case. Then we're going to talk a bit more about like, what are the best practices, what the industry recommends, what do we recommend, what we see in our customer environments, and what's the actually I know, need and solution on there. So with that in mind, um, the most basic question is where your data or like where your files live, right? So from that perspective, you need to think about more and more organizations are exposing themselves, either have solutions in their environment or they're using the cloud being in your own AWS environment or you're using a SaaS product and so on your files are scattered, right? You use a lot of solutions. The bigger the organization, the more tools you're using. And again, more and more, it's about collaboration, right? You're not exchanging files via email anymore. You have a lot more solutions. Each uh, of your employees most probably use half a dozen, if not more, different collaboration uh, applications. Zoom, in this example, being one of them. We're sharing files by Zoom. You have a support portal. You have a customer-facing portal, and so on. Right. So whenever we're talking about these kind of applications, it's a matter of like where are these applications actually hosted? And then we have like we try to trim them maybe in a couple of categories. The ones are more or less homegrown. Some of them are actually CMS based. So you build on top of a uh, very known popular content management system. The ones that are built on, uh, on CMS, they are exposed to certain vulnerabilities. Most of them are documented. Your teams are trying to catch up with um, patching all those vulnerabilities and so on. But more important is that the moment you're building custom solutions, you're building usually, and this takes a lot of time actually, right? You're not building something in a month and 
you're never going to touch it ever again. Especially when you're being bank, those things keep changing. You need to like grow it, change it, and so on. Regulations change. So from that perspective, that's a lot of work on your application team to actually manage that um, solution and also bring new functionality into it. And that's kind of the main concern, right? It's like we need to keep up with the new kind of changes, the new regulations, the new customer demand, and so on. And that will be uh, the main focus. And that can be, again, stored in your environment. Usually these are more, let's call them like legacy monolithic applications. And whenever the direction is to move into the cloud, that's even bigger of a focus and risk because it's going to take a monolithic application and move it to the cloud without taking all the uh, measures uh, that it's required in place, right? So there are functionalities in AWS that you're not, or Azure and so on, you don't have in your environment on-prem. And those are the ones that can get you exposed. Now, whenever we're talking about moving to the cloud, right, you have all these solutions, right? You're going to move to like an IS, let's say you're going to move to AWS, Azure, and so on, or you're going to use directly a SaaS product. So instead of building your own I don't know, support portal, you're going to look at Service Desk and look at Zendesk, for instance, right? So from that perspective, you're always going to balance, sorry, the need of bringing a brand new vendor in, bringing a new solution, adapting that solution, spend time to actually customize it to your needs or to use your legacy application or to build one from scratch with uh, your own requirements and deploy it and maintain it in the cloud environment. And again, look at these all productivity uh, tools. All of them are used to share files, right? Being, again, from enterprise products like Dropbox, Slack, and so on, right? To actually more social media. You have uh, Twitter, you have Instagram, where you're, uh, you're uh, sharing information with your uh, customers and you're still uploading files, you're still uh, using all those platforms to expose your content. And discussion moves more and more towards what are you giving up, right? You have the idea of having everything in your environment where you have like 100% control over it. You manage not only the virtual resources, but you're managing actually the infrastructure underneath, right? So you're responsible for the entire data center, you're responsible for the servers. If something uh, crashes, you need to like replace that component or you need to replace entire uh, stack as soon as possible. That's your responsibility. This is why moving to the cloud was uh, easily adopted. You pay per usage and you're not responsible for anything that's under the OS, right? So you're pretty much responsible mostly for the application layer and the configurations around it. And that will be, uh, that's a huge win, right? You no longer take care of the physical uh, part. You're just taking care of the uh, application configurations and the network configuration and so on, right? But more and more, again, the responsibility is about, or like the focus is about shifting right, shifting as much as possible this responsibility. So you're going to be responsible for way less, but you're giving up control over uh, the things that you're using, right? So the moment you uh, give up, let's say, the physical uh, data center, you're moving to the cloud, you're giving up uh, from the IS, you move to the platform as a service, you give up on the OS control and shared resource control, then you're moving to serverless, you just deploy your code, you execute your code, but you don't know exactly what's beneath it. Or you move to the SaaS where you have like no control over what happens in that uh, backend, right? You're just gonna use it as it is. You just configure to match your use case and that's uh, good enough for you. But again, you are giving up a lot of control and you rely more and more on your provider. And that's a little bit more challenging, right? Because like to a certain level, your goal is to make sure that your that solution solves your problem, right? So the focus is going to be again making sure that's adapted to your particular use case and scenario. But at the same time, you rely a lot on that uh, vendor to make sure it's going to uh, encrypt data at rest, it's going to secure it, it's going to make it highly available. And usually, actually, those are the two main responsibilities for each vendor, right? To make sure they're not going to lose your data and it's always encrypted and nobody can access it without your permission. However, someone can still reach out to that data. Someone might actually I don't know, compromise someone's credential and reach out and access someone's files, right? That's perfectly normal. But more than that, it's also the fact that the vendor or like the SaaS product or even the IS, they're not responsible for making sure that files that are malicious or risky in certain manner are not uploaded their platform, right? That's your responsibility. And that's the, the most important part, right? We're talking about this shared responsibility model where 
vendor is responsible for certain things and you take ownership on the, of the rest. You don't see it anywhere, the fact that, hey, they're just gonna put something in Eula maybe. You're not allowed to uh, upload the malicious file to our platform. But that doesn't mean that they're gonna uh, scan them, they're gonna actually prevent those malicious files to being out of their platform. And this is where you have to come in. And then we're talking about like how these kind of attacks or how these kind of uh, file uploads are actually uh, targeting these solutions, right? Again, being your own solution, being something in your environment, in the cloud, or a SaaS product, it's about, from my perspective, three types of attacks, right? It's a server-side attack, and this is the easiest one. You're going after the infrastructure. I'm trying to own that infrastructure, right? I'm trying to get as much as possible, I know, to get into one of the services, and then I do some lateral movement, maybe I can discover a couple more things there. There was a very good example not so long ago with a big bank where they actually used an easy, let's say, AWS functionality. Uh, the user data, right? You get uh, in, you do like an SRF uh, request, pretty much you ask the server to impersonate, uh, to do your own request, and you return the access keys. And then from there, you can access the infrastructure, right? And this is like a perfect example of like application are moving to the cloud where more or less they don't take everything in consideration. They're thinking again, it was a VM in my environment, I'm moving to the cloud, it's a VM there, what can go wrong, right? There are a lot of things that can go wrong. And this is where, again, it's very important, not just to expose uh, or like prevent exposing your access keys on GitHub, which was quite popular not so long time ago, right? It's more about preventing any kind of functionality in your application to make sure they're not gonna be exploited one way or another. I think the most important part from my perspective is that any functionality that's being built to ease the pain for the end user, right? Thread actors will always find a way to leverage that functionality, being in productivity file, being in a uh, web portal, being everywhere, right? The moment you expose a functionality that can be used in a malicious way, you need to consider that that's gonna be used in a malicious way, right? And that's again, back to that zero trust mindset. Don't believe that, hey, I expose something that is for the greater good. If there's like a 0.1% chance that someone can use it in a malicious way, it's going to be used in a malicious way. And again, People are sending files, people are crafting uh, the user input to try to hack your application, right? As part of a pen test, for instance, I, um, if you're doing a pen test on your application, they will always gonna try to do any kind of like, I don't know, SQL injection, code injection. Still, code injection is a very popular uh, one in OS top 10, right? So from that perspective, that will be a main focus for any penetration test. You need to think that user uh, file upload, it's still user input, it's still something that can be easily crafted, right? And from that perspective, that's something they will try to leverage against you. And especially if that's not something as part of a pen test, they spend too much time on crafting that uh, special document. Again, a very good example a couple of years back was Equifax, right? They crafted a document that was able to exploit a vulnerability in the parcel. From that perspective, that's how they got in, right? And again, these are the type of server type side attacks. They're going after the infrastructure, going after the solution, they actually get access to files or just defacement, depends what they're looking for, right? But that's what you should be aware of. And every time someone is responsible, let's say for the infrastructure, that's what they care about, right? They care about not getting hacked, not getting, uh, or like preventing this kind of attacks to get um, access to their infrastructure. However, again, the owner versus consumer uh, responsibility here, right? I'm the owner of the service, I make sure that my server side is fine, but what happens with the end user, right? That's kind of like, that, that's the consumer of my service. Is my responsibility or it's the end cost, uh, user's responsibility? Or it's actually a different team in my organization. Hey, if let's say I'm a bank, I receive these insurance forms, I'll make sure that the system is always highly available. I'll make sure the files are available to download uh, by someone in my organization. However, if they download it's a malicious file, is the, Endpoint security is problem. It's not mine anymore. The file got in, I made it highly available. So from that perspective, I did my job, right? It's a matter of like, those end users are your consumers, but you have a responsibility uh, for them, right? You need to make sure that the service you're providing is secure as well. Because the moment uh, these files are going on the high side, inside the parameter, I'm saying there, here, right? There's a high risk that those files are gonna be able to exploit something in that environment and do a lot more data exfiltration directly without actually um, having anything to do with your uh, infrastructure layer. 
right? So it's your application is going to be responsible for sharing that information inside the organization and get uh, pretty much that's the way in for the data breach. And in the same time, again, your application will be perceived as a distribution platform, being internally in the organization or externally. There are dozens of cases more and more popular where people are sharing malicious files or like they're sharing a Dropbox thing, a Google Drive link and so on, right? Because those are kind of productivity tools that are not gonna be banned easily in enterprises. And you're gonna you know, share a file. Hey, I send you this insurance form. I cannot upload to your portal, something's wrong. Here's a link, right? And they're using these kind of tools to actually distribute the malicious uh, document. People will trust them, right? But if I'm able to share uh, or like upload the file to Again, a support portal, being Salesforce, uh, being Zendesk and so on, and I can take that link and share with someone, that's also legit, but I'm gonna use, again, that platform as a distribution platform. I'm storing my malicious files on a highly reputable source, and people will trust them, right? And this is kind of like the way to get in way more easy. Instead for me to convince you I'm a legit user, it's easier to convince you that I'm actually using a uh, legitimate and highly trusted application. Once again, the word trust, right? Can you trust that one? Can you validate? Are you sure that content's being uploaded those uh, platforms is secure as well? Once again, most of the applications out there being SaaS or not, they're gonna be highly focused on making that content available and secure, meaning encrypted address, not necessarily for them to scan for malicious files and uh, sanitize the content and so on. That's something that's still your responsibility. Now let's talk a little bit about like what's recommended when it comes to file upload, right? The, I think everybody here uh, knows OWASP. If you don't, please quickly do a Google search on this one. They're the ones that recommended what's actually important for web application security, right? They're the ones that are listing the top 10 uh, vulnerabilities for web applications and so on. And they're the ones that are putting cheat sheets that are used most like a checklist for all penetration test organizations out there. And this is pretty much a screenshot from that cheat sheet for file upload. And there are quite a few things that I think are highly important here. There are quite a few things I think we can do better, right? So the most important part is whenever you receive content from the outside, once again, file upload is user input. So you need to look at this content and make sure you do the same validations that you do in any other input, right? So we're gonna look, okay, I. I'm allowing these uh, files in. What kind of files am I allowing in? Then you have to look at like the file type. As you can see here, they're saying that you should whitelist extensions. First, the check for uh, the file type validation should happen always on the server side, now on client side, because that's the easiest thing to trick. The moment you do it on the client side, I can put my, I don't know, any proxy, burp, whatever, change uh, the content however I want, and then I can forward the request, right? I can make it on the client side to look like it's a PNG, intercept that request, change it back to executable and release it. Nobody's gonna stop me doing that, right? So you do the validation on the server side, but as you see, see here, you cannot rely on content type. Well, you cannot rely on extension either, right? Once again, I can even upload the file as a PNG, but for it to be executable, I'll find ways, different ways maybe to detonate that file. Right, so from that perspective, you always need to check for the true file type. Don't rely just on the file extension. That's the easiest way to bypass most of the systems, right? You need to check for a true file type. And that's a pretty complex logic. The moment you're gonna go and accept more and more file types, that's gonna become a bit complex as well to manage. Then it's always about like the file name, right? You need to have, um, mostly it's recommended to put something random as a file name and to make sure the file name is legit as well. So there were a lot of attacks, especially in CMS systems, that were relying on um, a path traversal, right? So I put my file name to have, I don't know, to traverse through the entire tree and go to a particular file, HD access, for instance. So I rewrite the HD access file, then I have access to the system easily, right? And those are kind of things that you always need to keep in mind. So you need to store those files, store them somewhere else, not in the root. So, and also make sure you do a validation of the file name so it's not gonna use a path traversal mechanism. I'm still shocked that mechanism still works even today in certain organizations. Now, it's a matter of like file size limit. It's a problem of I'm gonna receive a big file that's gonna crash my system. How much uh, resources I have? How much can I store, right? If it's your, in your own environment, that's gonna be a concern. If it's, I don't know, in your AWS and so on, 
you're going to pay for that storage, right? If I keep submitting files of like terabytes and terabytes, that's not going to be an easy thing for you. You're going to be charged for that one. And maybe are irrelevant files anyway. But maybe I'm going to do a good job trying to see if I can actually crash the system, if there's any limitation on like how much I can output. Then it's a matter of like trusting your users, right? Only allow authorized users to upload the file. Well, I, most of the applications out there offers like free registration. So getting an authorized user is not a big deal, right? There are a lot of bots. There was a lot of publicity on like uh, Twitter. There was at some point deleting over 1 million accounts a day, right? And that affected again, back to that distribution uh, platform, right? Used in a, by the threat actors in a malicious way as a distribution platform. Just the fact you're trusting the users, I don't think that's good enough, right? Don't trust the users. Even the user can be compromised. Yes, it's a matter of like filtering who's able to upload files to your system, right? You're gonna have some audit trail if you want, but again, who is that user? You don't have much control over it. And even if you do, that user can still be compromised as well, right? Now, storing the files to a different system, we already kind of like touched on that one, especially if you're going to the cloud, you're gonna use different services, you're not gonna store it on the local machine. The one I highlight here is to run the file from an AV or a sandbox to make sure it doesn't contain malicious data. Sorry. Well, that's definitely not enough. And I'll explain in a second, right? It's a matter of like, you want to run that file uh, to check for malicious content. From that perspective, one AV, it's not enough. You're just che checking this box, right? You're saying, yes, I scan it, but static analysis to some level depends on the tools you're using might be way under 50% of detection, right? You're gonna see all these reports, I'm gonna to touch back on that one on the next slide, but you'll see all these reports on like how good is each anti malware engine, but you're not comparing static with whatever you have on the endpoint. Even more, if you detonate that file in a sandbox, if you have a solution that's being upload, it's uploading in your environment over a million files a day, for you to keep up with the sandbox, that would be a huge cost. And more than that, sandboxes are highly focused on malware analysis, not to give you a thumbs out, thumbs down approach, right? It's not gonna be able to tell you like 100% this file is malicious or not. And more important, even if there are things that might be malicious in that file, there are so many mechanisms to evade detection in sandbox that if you don't just try to do it automatically, it's gonna be very expensive, right? You're gonna have to detonate in a lot of environments, do a lot of tweaks and so on, and then it's still gonna be quite easy to bypass those systems. And the sandbox is very important for it if you use it in the front line, pretty much used as the gatekeeper to replicate as much as possible or entirely your end user's environment. So if I detonate a PDF in a Windows 8 or Windows I don't know, 7 with uh, Acrobat Reader 1, 2, 3, but I use Windows 10 with Acrobat Reader 15, on my endpoint, it's relevant if the vulnerability is for Acrobat Reader 15, right? And those are kind of things you always need to look for. And again, it's not about checking your box, it's actually about delivering a secure solution to your end users. And the rest is, I know, pretty straightforward. Make sure whatever you use are uh, not vulnerable, right? Back to the Equifax example where you use a tool to parse that file that has a, a vulnerability that can be exploited, right? And then make sure you don't have, uh, the file output are not exposed to like CRS attacks or even like SRF attacks. There's like plenty of examples where you have a PDF that has I know, is some um, DDE where you're trying to like reach out outside your uh, request and pretty much it's calling the malicious uh, uh, actors I don't know, website, right, API, and it's gonna put there the access keys from the system. That's an easy, very easy, it's like a five minute tutorial online if you want how to achieve that one. And that's something that is still a valid point. So when it comes to our recommendations, highly important, Again, don't rely on the file extension. Always check the true file types. And once again, the more file types you're allowing, the more and more complex the logic is gonna become, right? And this is the part you want to make sure it's bulletproof. Don't allow file types that just mimic some behavior, right? There was, I don't know, there's a lot more here, not just, I don't know, renaming the file. Maybe I can attach the file. Maybe I can include also like in the EXIF, in the images, some, uh, uh, there was an example with base64 encoded malicious script, right? I can easily embed in that one and so on, right? So look at the true file types and make sure you whitelist or blacklist based on that. Then always scan with multiple anti-malware engines. 
And that's not something I recommend just because Opsal is offering that. It's because that's how you get away better detection, right? You want to be secure. You need to make sure you're doing your best to actually offer that secure a layer. If you just want to tick that box, you're going to put one AV, files are going to pass through, and you're not going to, uh, you're just going to say, yes, I'm covered. I use the guideline, but that's not going to solve anything, right? Your organization was already exposed. And this is, again, the discussion I had in the previous slide as well. What is static and what is dynamic? A lot of these uh, engines, let's say, if you deploy your endpoint product on your machine, on your PC, that's going to do a lot more than what you can do in a static environment, right? That one is going to be able to see when you open the file, what happens when you open the file. It's trying to get access to PowerShell. It's trying to download the file. It's dumping something. It's executing some commands and so on. In a static environment, you're not going to see that, right? When you, whenever you're uh, in a dynamic environment, you're going to see that execution for maybe like a minute, two minutes, 10 seconds, doesn't matter. In a static environment, I have milliseconds to look at the file. And yes, we are recommending more and more AVs because each of them brings something unique to the table, right? Even in a static environment. A lot of them ha have heuristics. A lot of them will try to execute certain portions of the code and try to emulate that execution to see if there's anything malicious. But again, it's not going to have seconds or minutes. It's going to have milliseconds to do that. So it's very hard to, for one engine in a static environment to offer like 100% detection, right? Even for known files, even though there are like known malicious files out there, it's still almost impossible for one engine to offer that detection ratio. So this is where it comes into play our next topic, and that's sanitizing the content. Once again, we're talking about content validation and content sanitization for any user input in a web application. File upload, it's still, user input, right? So the, the way you, you're, I don't know, breaking apart the user input and you're validating it and then you're using it in your backend, the same exact way you should do it with uh, uh, file upload as well. All the files that are being uploaded should use the exactly same mechanism. Then a little bit about the access control, right? It's a matter of like, hey, I have access control in place because an authenticated user was the one uploading the file only him he can access or like he shared it with someone else and so on. That user can still be uh, compromised, right? And I can uh, use someone's credentials to upload a malicious file. I can use that credentials to actually do my, I don't know, um, attack. And he's gonna not, not going to be aware of that. And that's the part where, yes, X control measures should be in place, right? And also X control on the files, like what can be detonated, what will be... Uh, it's going to run, who has access to those files on the system and so on. So those are things that are very important, but it's not going to offer you a bulletproof solution. Those are more like common sense measures to like implement, but it's not going to cover necessarily this story. And also there's like a lot more nowadays about how you handle sensitive information, right? If I upload the file that contains a lot of PI information that was, was not supposed to be there, but I'm negligent or I can actually try to attack that organization by exposing, I know, I'm going to put some credit cards numbers, uploading the, that file, it's going to go through a system that is not supposed to see that, and then that organization is responsible for PCI uh, violations, right? And it's going to get a huge fine, bad reputation, and so on, right? Those are kind of things that you should always consider, like, from the gate uh, gateway, right? Right from the beginning, at the entry point, oh, this file contains sense information, I'm going to reject it, or if I'm supposed to allow it, it's going to go to a different route than the ones that the have maybe sensitive information, right? It's maybe gonna go to a different repository with a lot more policies in place with only limited access to it and so on. And those are things that you need to implement right from the gateway, uh, right from the entry point, not wait all the way uh, after the file is being accessed to realize, ah, this contained PI information, I'm gonna send to someone else. One of the things I want to mention is our, one of our customer testimonials. Um, especially nowadays when uh, work from home is so popular and uh, Upwork is one of the biggest, uh, more or less it's called in like a freelance marketplace in the world. Um, so from that perspective, they're a very good customer of ours. They used our solution for years. They start with the multi scanning and then they moved also to uh, sanitization as well. What the engine we call is DeepCDR. And that's the one that they're using to make sure that files are not being uploaded, malicious files are not being uploaded to their platform. And this is a perfect example where their platform was actually used as a distribution platform, right? People were uploading malicious files. They're going after their customers pretty much, right? And 
they implement a lot of solutions. They uh, implement even multi scanning, they implement uh, also the sandboxes. They tried a lot of solutions, and the ones that they found the most effective was the deep CDR one. And I think the major result here is not the fact that we managed to sell, solve that problem for them, it's also that the threat actors were not using that. Uh, their platform anymore because they're discouraged about the efficiency of our product, right? From that perspective, they stopped uploading malicious files because there was no uh, return from them. And that's a very good example, like how putting the perfect solution, like the right solutions in place, is going to protect all your users right from the beginning, right? Right at the, that entry point. And to touch a bit more on DeepCDR, DeepCDR is a technology that grows a lot for us, right? A lot of people, especially in the file upload where we have a huge footprint, uh, a lot of people reach out to us for the multi-scanner, but eventually they uh, are the ones that actually go and license both the multi-scanning and DeepCDR. And this is the one where taking each file, or like look at the file structure, look at the true file type, right? Then look at the file structure and remove any embedded object that might drive a malicious behavior. And this is key. We don't remove malicious content necessarily. We remove any embedded objects that might drive that malicious behavior. We remove any active content, anything that has attached scripts or anything that might actually have embedded scripts in it. So for instance, even images are the ones that we are sanitizing and we go through the uh, recursively to the entire uh, chain. So if you have like a Word doc in an Excel, in another Word doc, in a PDF, and PDF you have another like 20 images and so on, we go through the entire tree and we sanitize everything as well. And that's the most important part. We're trying to keep everything, all the usability. So if you have a PDF, you're going to use a PDF on the other side. If you have an Excel with formulas, you're going to use an Excel with formulas on the other side. But if you have like, I don't know, macros or JavaScript or all the object, activities controls and things like that, those are the things that we're sanitizing and uh, most of them are being removed, right? So that's the most important part. You're going to keep your content, you're going to keep your uh, usability. However, we're going to remove things that might have that malicious behavior. And to some level, you need to consider, especially in the file upload use case, like how often do you actually need people to send you, I don't know, resumes with JavaScript in it, right? It's just a PDF should be just content. You don't need and the extra scripts and so on, right? Why do you need, I don't know, uh, insurance form to have JavaScript in it? Why do you need an Excel file, which was supposed to be a CSV uh, that's actually an Excel with some macros in it and so on? Those are kind of things that, again, it's not just the true file type that's going to uh, flag uh, a problem there. It's actually the fact that they're going to use additional tools, let's say additional functionalities in the legit applications to actually uh, get in, right? And that's where you're going to be vulnerable because you're going to whitelist those file types or you're going to allow those file types, you're going to scan them, but most probably you're not going to have a very good detection ratio on things that are hidden inside the file. And this is what we're uh, suggesting, and this is what our customers are heavily using. It's either a core API direct integration or TriCap, and I'll explain that in a second as well. But for API, all the configurations, everything happens on the backend. All you have to do is like two to three API calls. But you just submit the file, you get a data ID back. You can also provide the callback URL. So we have the webhook mechanism, let's say, where when the analysis is finished, we call you back. But if you cannot expose that one through your own web service, API gateway, and so on. Then you just make a call, get the data ID back, and then you're doing, we have a polling mechanism in place where you can query to see if the analysis is finished. Once the analysis is finished, you can get the entire analysis report. If you also go with sanitization as well, you can actually retrieve the sanitized file as well. So those are the, the two to three API calls that you have to do to integrate with our solution. One thing to keep in mind is that, very important, we are providing a report for CDR, we call it CDR details, where you actually see everything was sanitized, what embedded objects were in that file, uh, even like the script that was embedded in that file. Uh, we're gonna have everything listed for you to be aware, like what's actually, um, what's the risk you're being exposed to, right? So in case someone comes back to you saying, hey, I received this file from, I don't know, my accounting firm and I need that file with the macro in it, you can actually first go back to see exactly what was in that file. Maybe you want to current in that file and to run into a couple more sources and so on, and then you're gonna uh, provide to the end user. That rarely happens, to be honest. I think most of the time, especially in the file upload use case, that you your end user will always gonna use the same test copy. As I mentioned, we have a different integration point, which is the manager ICAP server. 
this is something that for us grew heavily in the last two years. Uh, we have an outstanding partnership with F5, for instance, where we're able to integrate with their load balancer, web product, and so on. Uh, so pretty much, again, right at the entry point, right? The web application firewall sits right in front of all the web services. That's the one that intercepts the file, offloads that traffic to us. We are looking at the file. We're actually able to sanitize, even redact that file that has any sensitive information in it. And then the web is going to release that file to the web service. So no malicious file, no sensitive data and stone will reach your backend. Everything is going to be handled right from the entry point. And we also have like a, uh, a very good partnership with Microsoft, where Microsoft recommends us uh, for their customers that are that have more of a NAS use. So like people are putting files, files are being stored in a NAS product, let's say your EMC Isilon. We can have the same ICAP integration with that NAS product to the ICAP server and we can scan and uh, send those files as well. And that's those are two very good partnerships for us. We have quite a few more ICAP partnerships. Uh, we integrate with a lot more vendors, more actually we're in the works right now to build a better story or like a better coverage, let's say a couple more vendors. So that's the part I think you should look at. The most important takeaway from this ICAP story is that one, on the API side, you need to go, maybe your application team is gonna have to schedule that API integration. For me, it's something that takes, let's say, from a couple of minutes to like tops two hours to integrate through the API. However, to roll out that one, to go through uh, the entire, I don't know, deployment plan uh, and so on, scheduling it, in some organizations, that, get, that can actually take a year, right? And that's not just on the application team. That's actually to align everything before this application goes live in the production, right? All that API changes or in the flow of changes in your application to be validated and uh, approved, that will take a while, right? More and more organizations, we have a very niche customer base, let's say, that are concerned, they're heavily concerned about privacy and security. So for them, that actually can take a bit longer. This is where the math and the IKEA comes into play. This is more on the networking side and actually on the application side. To integrate with your F5 literally takes three minutes, right? You just, we have an IKEA template. You just put in the F5 uh, appliance. You just hit a button. It's gonna fill up all the, generate all the virtual pools. And then you're just gonna select, okay, I want for this IKEA profile to put this IKEA server at this port. Click OK and you're done. That's all you have to do, right? And from that perspective, like three minutes is not just a quick way to do the POC. It's also a very quick way to market, very fast, or like a very uh, fast way to actually go to production instead of doing all the API changes. That's why we got a lot of traction on this one as well. So it's always kind of like a compromise on like what you want on your side. And another very important topic on the ICAP side is that that creates uh, not just less dependency on the API structure, but it's also, once you integrate to the API, you're restricted to the options you have in that current JSON response when you build integration, right? But we bring new tools to the market, right? We bring a lot of new functionality. We try to expose more information uh, through our API, right? So for instance, the CDR details is something that is quite new and we're adding more and more information to that one as well. We're trying to add more functionality on the DLP, not just redaction, but a lot more functionality there as well. So those are kind of things that you will have to go back to your API integration and consume the new uh, fields in the JSON response. However, if you go on the ICAP side, all that information is going to be grandfathered in. Everything we expose in the, I in the API, we're going to consume it on the ICAP side as well. So we take care of that uh, integration for you. Pretty much, you outsource that integration to us. You just have that entry point for the ICAP server, and everything else is being managed by us. Um, a couple of things here, like, I think this is the most important part. This kind of product is heavily used, or let's say, um, we started actually the Mad Defender product more like in 2006. This was heavily used in government, um, especially like military. Uh, we have a huge footprint. Most of the nuclear facilities in the US are using this and, and so on, right? And the big, two very big uh, use cases for us in the past were cross-domain and more analysis. Cross domain meaning transferring files, everything from low to high, being unsecured to secure, nipper to zipper, and so on, right? Um, that's how, uh, again, a lot of government is using us. Uh, the, most of the energy, especially like nuclear industry, is using us. Nuclear literally has like a kiosk, an ATM lookalike, a solution where they plug in their media, scan all those files, and 
uh, they have like an armed guard making sure that everything is being analyzed and they can go only after the was analyzed on the high side with the USB, right? And we take all that intelligence, let's say, everything we've built on the file analysis side, and that's what we brought for file upload, right? And that's exactly the same thing we have for the email security and so on. Again, sanitizing content. In email, it makes total sense to sanitize attachments. We can do a lot better on file upload from that perspective as well, right? We provide a lot better tool set, toolkit, for you to be able to leverage in your file upload use case. Then we have a totally separate uh, uh, side of the business. There's a totally different business unit that handles secure device access and NAC as well, right? And that's something that we have uh, over 100 million endpoints worldwide. It's pretty much uh, either through OEMs or direct uh, customers as well. As Doug mentioned in the beginning, uh, we released our Ops Academy uh, quite recently, like six months ago. Um, this is something that we got a lot of interest in, right? And this is kind of uh, the type of, um, let's say, engagement where we're trying to give back to our community what we learned, what, what we know based on our experience in the past almost 20 years of protecting critical infrastructures, right? So please, again, all these are free. We released a professional uh, class as well, but all these ones that are listed here are free. Try to uh, check them out, especially now where we have spent a lot more time at home Try checking out, try to learn a bit more on like what's our philosophy, what's our recommendation for critical infrastructure in general, and also to some level like how our products fit in that philosophy. And based on that one, one step further, right? We have all this, uh, all the deployments we have when it comes to file upload security, right? All the recommendations we provide to our customers and so on. This is something that we uh, built in more of a security assessment. Uh, uh, engagement so we can actually come to your or like discuss with your teams try to put together a plan to see if you have all the security measures in place see if there's anything that we can do actually to bypass your systems and we can recommend you a couple of things there as well this is not uh, an engagement to say yes you should I don't know sanitize with CDR and that's it right it's actually a better understanding of like what you are doing and what we've seen in other organiza organizations and what you should consider as well And uh, since I'm getting very close to the finish line, there are a couple of things that I think are very important as takeaways, right? Once again, share responsibility. Just the fact you're using someone else's infrastructure, just the fact you're using someone else's product entirely, go through a SaaS product and so on, you still have a responsibility to end, end users. Maybe it's no longer your responsibility to prevent against server-side attacks, let's say, but it's definitely your responsibility to your end users that they're gonna be safe or you're gonna offer um, malicious or like a malware free uh, file to your end users. And also it's, your solution is not gonna be used at the distribution platform. So always look at that one. Look at what you can do to achieve, to add that security layer on top of the solution you're already providing. And again, don't just uh, go to the checklist and say, yes, I scan with one AV. Uh, believe it or not, even like very large organizations are relying on claim AV, right? It's an open source one. It's so easy for malicious actors to just use that one to see, okay, this is how I can bypass it. I'm gonna craft my malware sample that I'm gonna easily bypass them maybe, and then I'm going after your organization. You're a lot more exposed to that one than anything else. More important, and I think this is the biggest takeaway. This is the one I really want you to stick with. Like file upload is user input. Once again, you have your application team, your developers spending a lot of time trying to prevent uh, injection, right? Trying to put play, uh, measures in place to make sure nobody uses the, uh, I don't know, the user input, the fields as injection methods. Sorry. File upload is exactly the same thing as that one, right? You put your application firewall in front of it to prevent injection and so on, but in that one is not gonna prevent injection via file upload. So that one is one of the most important ones for me. Then it's always this kind of like combo, right? Owner versus consumer. Are you responsible for the infrastructure? Are you responsible for the end users? You should be responsible for both, right? The moment you put the solution in front of your end users, you're gonna be hold, hold responsible, right? Nobody's gonna, yes, even though you put in your EULA, every, even if you specify that, I don't know, application security, I'm responsible for not getting my application uh, hacked, but the moment 
they're gonna down that file from your solution, you're gonna be, uh, I don't know, people are gonna point fingers at you. They're gonna say, yes, I download this solution from, I don't know, that bank shared the file with me, that, uh, I don't know, download this file from Google Drive, Dropbox, whatever. They will point fingers, and that's how your brand is gonna get affected as well. And very important, just the fact that you have an authenticated user, that doesn't mean you can trust it. That doesn't mean that the content or like the files that are sharing, the files that are being uploaded to your platform are actually safe and secure, right? This is the part that's very important. Any end user can be compromised as well. And also maybe they don't know, maybe there are also like inside trades as well. Like maybe they want to upload malicious files. So that's something that, again, apply that zero trust mentality. Don't trust the users. Don't trust the files. Don't trust anything. Take us a deep uh, inspection approach as possible to make sure everything is handled in the same way, right? Think about especially there are use cases, let's say, these just want to explain like on email, people are sharing a lot of files. Most of the spear phishing attacks are going after uh, the CEO accounting and so on that have access to a lot of uh, data, right? You're not gonna ease the uh, security policies for them just because it's easier for them or because you trust your CEO, right? Same thing here, just because it's your CEO's username uploading the file, doesn't mean that, ah, no security in place, just let, just bypass the system and let it through. Right? Exactly the same approach is gonna be here. Just try to put the right security measures in place and regardless of the source of the file, regardless where it's coming from, from whom and so on, you're always gonna use the same tools. And with that in mind, I think we're ready for questions. Thank you very much. All right. Well. Thank you, George. So now we want to open up the uh, webinar to questions. Um, there are a number of questions. If we're unable to answer your questions during um, this last 10 to 12 minutes, uh, we'll follow up by email. So George, um, a few questions. Does this work in Amazon Web Services and do you scan S3 buckets? Um, yes, so we do have, um, Actually, we offer Man Defender as a bring your own license in AWS Marketplace right now. Uh, we're trying to expand a lot more our partnership with AWS. We have actually, we're part of their partner network. We're an advanced APN partner. Um, we do offer um, our solution in AWS. We also have our Man Defender Cloud, and maybe that's not a thing to mention. You can use our Man Defender toolset in your environment by licensing Man Defender Core or the ICAP server, as I explained before, but you can also rely on our SaaS product, Man Defender Cloud where you can just integrate by API and send to our SaaS uh, model. And that's pretty much price uh, tier based uh, based on consumption, right? So it, you can actually offload, let's say that infrastructure layer, as I said in uh, the past, like shift to right as much as possible responsibility and the infrastructure is gonna be our responsibility in deploying and maintaining these systems. Now with that in mind on AWS, yes, we can uh, deploy our solution, you can use to integrate with API or even the ICAP to be used in AWS. As for S3, uh, we have quite a few customers using us to scan the S3 buckets. Uh, we're gonna release actually uh, roughly in a week, a new product that actually offers a native integration to uh, S3, AWS S3 as well. So from that perspective, we're gonna orchestrate all the integration and everything to send the files for analysis and also I know, block the files, tag them and so on. So you're going to be able to do that natively as well very soon. Okay. Um, so we have a question. Does this solution server, uh, does this solution server serve as a WAF? Uh, no. So, and that's actually a very good question, right? Uh, as I explained in the slide with the ICAP, for instance, and maybe I should go back to that one for a second. So F5, let's say X, uh, S, uh, sorry acts as a web in this situation, right? F5 is the web application firewall, but web application firewall is focused on a couple of things. Uh, I think F5 is actually doing a very good job on the web uh, side, they're leader in that market, right? But it's a matter of like, they need to care, take care of like OAS top 10, they need to care about DOS attacks, botnets and so on, right? But they're not gonna inspect the traffic. We are not addressing anything, we're not taking care of DOS attacks, we're not taking care of botnets, we're not taking care of, we're not looking at the traffic from that perspective, right? What we're looking is we're inspecting the files, right? That's the ones that we're focusing on. So uh, I would say the right answer for your question is more that we augment web, we're complementing its functionality when it comes to file upload. So for instance, if you have a web application that actually doesn't expose any file upload functionality, 
a web will uh, be good enough for you, right? If you have a function or a port that actually exposes a file output functionality, you need to look at that traffic. You need to look at like what files are being shared and so on. And that's where we come in. Okay, next question is, is this just for VMs or are containers such as Docker supported? Um, yes, yeah, so right now the solution is deployed in uh, VMs. So regardless where um, you have the VMs, it can be in your, in your data center, on-premise, can be in AWS, Azure, Google Cloud, Alibaba, IBM, Bluemix, you name it. Uh, but we're looking at right now the score actually to offer this one uh, to support Docker containers as well. So from that perspective, we're trying to break, let's say, Mad Defender in a smaller, more like a microservices approach, so you can actually scale out quite easily. Uh, as legacy, let's say, Mad Defender was seen more of a, a robust server that's going to run 24 7. We're spending a lot more cycles actually nowadays to offer this one as a more cloud friendly uh, solution. And container usage is definitely something that grew a lot recently. Great. Next question: uh, Are the files being shared with Boss SWAT or uploaded to each antivirus for analysis? Uh, no. So yes, the way it works is something like this: um, you upload the file to our solution, like you know, you call the API to for us to uh, process your files, right? And then we have again the on-prem or like the MediFender core, the one you deploy in your VM, and the SaaS model. For MediFender core, all the analysis is being done in that environment. No data. It goes out. We don't even report hashes to our infrastructure or to the vendors. So everything happens in your environment. That, for instance, the same solution is heavily used uh, by government. And over 40% of them are using offline, sorry, in offline environment anyway. So uh, we can guarantee that no data leak is going to happen from that solution, right? All the vendors are pretty much in a more or less of a container, like a sandbox that they cannot actually reach out their cloud anyway. All of them are configured not to reach out their cloud and so on. So from that perspective, everything, it ha what happens, happens in that VM. No data is being reported either to us or the AV vendors. On the other side, on MediFender Cloud, there are two flavors of it, right? There's one that's kind of like uh, free API usage where you can actually play with it, uh, play with the API. That's something, the moment you upload files to that free API, you make OpsWAT the owner of, the, of that file, right? And OpsWAT, um, it's pretty much at OpsWAT's discretion if they're going to share that file with the malware vendor or not, uh, anti malware vendor or not, right? It's a matter of, uh, for us, the moment we receive a file, for instance, to the free API and we say, okay, this file was flagged by two out of the 40 vendors. We're going to spend more time to see if this is actually a potential, a potential outbreak or it's actually a false positive. And based on that, we're going to report maybe to the vendors to improve their detection ratio as well, right? So it's a matter for us to contribute back uh, to the vendors. Now we have the commercial API. For the commercial API, you are the owner of the file. Pretty much through the API, you're telling us, don't store this file, right? You have a, select, a call or like a header, let's say, in the API call saying that I'm not allowed to share, I'm not allowed to keep this file. So the moment we analyze that file, we finish the analysis, we're gonna delete that file, and uh, we're never gonna be able to retrieve it, right? So it's your choice on that side. Whatever you use in your environment, nothing goes out, Whatever it's in the SaaS product, it's a choice. But in general, if you go, if you license the SaaS product, that means you're gonna be able, to, you're gonna use actually the private analysis, call it that way. Hope that makes sense. Okay. Uh, next question: How do you manage the encrypted file uploads? Um, so if you go directly to the REST API, you can pass the encryption uh, passphrase as a uh, pretty much as a parameter, as a header. So from that perspective, you send the file. Um, whenever you submit the file, you put that uh, passphrase as well as one of the headers. We're going to take that file, we're going to decrypt it, and we're going to analyze it as a decrypted file. And we can provide you back even the same as copy. Next question. How, how many files per hour can be scanned and sanitized? Uh, well, that's a very, it's kind of like, uh, hard to estimate, right? So there are like a lot of uh, moving pieces here. It's a matter of like what is what we define as a file and also like what's the infrastructure layer. So to give an example, right? The fact that I'm submitting a PDF for analysis, maybe that PDF can take somewhere between, I don't know, 200 milliseconds to be scanned and sanitized to maybe like, I don't know, five, 10, 15 seconds, right? Does that PDF, for instance, if it contains, I don't know, it's a PDF with 500 pages and each page has two images, 
I'm going to have to analyze like a thousand objects there, right? And that's the, probably the most important part. Like when we define throughput, we're looking more at like objects level than actually just files, right? Even though from the outside world might look like a file, we're going to try to deconstruct that one and analyze each piece in it, right? And that's the most important part that you need to make sure that whenever you're, I don't know, validating this solution, let's say, when you're doing a POC, you're using a, um, more or less, let's say, a data set close to your environment. Add a customer that POC the, our solution and they're like, okay, uh, I'm uploading one file and it took me four hours and a half to analyze this file. And when they shared the file with us, it was actually an archive that had over 500,000 files in it. So it's a bit hard for me to say, yes, it's just one file, right? If you want to extract the files in an archive, you, we're gonna count those ones as well. And then it's gonna take a lot more time. So I think as a rough estimate, each deployment on premise, you can estimate somewhere close to like a million files a day. We have some analysis, we can send that over by email as well. Uh, you can actually see the throughput based on the packages that we have in place. So ranges somewhere between like 2 million and drops close to like a million. But uh, it's important for you to understand that data set is gonna be the one that uh, is gonna say how long is this gonna take, right? So I think it's more for you to be able to try it out as soon as possible, let's say, uh, based on your own data set, and then you're gonna understand the better the throughput. So my recommendation is always try to leverage something close to like a million files a day, um, and also maybe somewhere between one, maximum two seconds per file. We do have some parallel processing and that's very important, that's key, right? But cell level, even those uh, functionalities are gonna trim down a little bit or like we're gonna reach a peak where it's gonna flatten out. So how does the solution scale horizontally and vertically and how do I scale from any? Uh, that's actually a very good segue from the previous question. So um, horizontally, it's recommended. That means you need to buy more instances, right? Vertically, it's going to scale to a certain point. So it depends, again, on the number of, um, I don't know, what modules, what exactly you're licensing for, and what are the files you're using it for. It's going to scale, but you cannot throw at it, let's say, uh, a monster server with, I don't know, 120, 140, whatever, CPU cores and two terabytes of memory and expect this one to scale infinitely, right? So it's easier, and I think, again, back to... Uh, even like AWS and cloud infrastructure and so on, it's recommended actually to scale horizontally because you're gonna offer not just uh, a more highly available fault tolerant system as well, but you're not gonna uh, spend a lot more money to build a super expensive infrastructure layer, but you're gonna reach that peak where in, unfortunately it's gonna flat out, flatten out. Because again, there's a lot of IO, there's a lot of CPU consumption, there's like a lot of things that are happening behind the scene for the analysis, right? And we cannot guarantee that we're going to be able to always consume all the resources that uh, you put uh, in place, right? There are certain vendors that are taking a bit longer than the other ones. So even, let's say, for the multi-scanning component, maybe 90% of the vendors, let's say you license something with like 20 engines, 90% of them will finish in like 20 milliseconds, 50 milliseconds, but it's going to be one or two of them are going to take 300, 700 milliseconds. We need to wait for those ones as well, right? So from that perspective, you're not going to be able to ingest more and more files. Okay, um, so we have time for one last question. Um, can this be deployed inline for real-time analysis? And, and secondly, is it possible to export the logs uh, into a SIM solution? Um, okay, so let's have the nice two separate questions. Like the first one, if I can put it inline. Yes, so in general, uh, this is kind of like our recommendation as well. Again, for the file upload use case, we recommend to put us this one in line. And this is like a perfect example, the one with the ITF, where you see that the traffic is stopped at that entry point and offloaded to my defender and then released uh, in the backend, right? So that's exactly the perfect um, scenario where you're putting our solution in line. But in line is very important, again, when it comes to what's the, sorry, what's the expectation. If you expect that file to be analyzed in, I don't know, 20 milliseconds, I'm not sure that's 100% feasible, right? And also there's a matter of like network latency, how large is the file, how, I know, if you're gonna upload a file of two terabytes, well, it's gonna take some time to upload the file, regardless how long it's gonna take the analysis as well, right? So we can be put in line, we recommend to be put in line, right? But there are a few things that you should consider once, I know. I think for file upload, actually, it's the easiest one to accept because 
there's no such thing like let's say like web browsing when you're looking at like the browser why it's not loading it took me like five uh, I don't know, seconds to load this website this is terrible right now when it comes to let's say uh, for file upload it's not on the high side people expect that file to be in the milliseconds there uh, when it comes to the other one, uh, I hope this clarifies. Uh, when it comes to the SIM integration, yes, we have syslog integration. So that means you can offload all that uh, logs to any SIM. We have quite a few people using it, especially, again, SIM usage is quite heavily important in our enterprise customers or even like governments. And we have a lot of integrations, let's say, people are using it with Splunk, uh, Curator, ArcSight, and so on. Okay. Um... That takes us to the end of this webinar. Thank you everybody for joining us. Uh, we will be sending a copy of uh, the recorded webcast along with the PowerPoint slides and the PDF to all the uh, registrants. Thank you and have a great day. Thank you, George. Thank you very much, everyone. Stay safe. Bye-bye.